Welcome to the Artemis Gold Blackwater Mine Expansion Study Conference Call and Webinar. As a reminder, all participants are in listen-only mode and the meeting is being recorded. After the presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. If you wish to ask a question, please click on the Q&A icon on the left-hand side of the screen. You will see the options to raise your hand to join the queue and ask your question verbally, or write a question to submit your question in writing. Webinar participants who are introduced to ask their questions verbally will see a prompt on screen. Please press continue to confirm that you're ready to have your line opened. Analysts who have dialed in on the conference call may press star then one on their telephone keypad to join the question queue. I would now like to turn the meeting over to Stephen Dean, Chair and CEO of Artemis Gold. Please go ahead. Thank you, Gaylene, and good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, the, um, we're going to uh, share with you the results of the expansion study on our Blackwater Mine a project under development in central British Columbia. Uh, on the call uh, in Artemis's office here this, this morning uh, is Jeremy Langford, our President and Chief Operating Officer. Jerry Van der Westhazen, our Chief Financial Officer, and Meg Brown, our VP Investor Relations. Jeremy and I will take you through a few slides and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, I want to bring your attention to this cautionary note, as is the uh, convention in these types of presentations. There's a lot of forward-looking information and you should read this statement in the context of this information. Um, I'm also going to uh, propose that we, um, that, that, that we take the, the press release as read, because there's a lot of information in that. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the highlights uh, in a short presentation that um, Jeremy and I will walk you through uh, over the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, we're going to try and keep a significant amount of time for q and I think that's probably going to be the most productive for all of you who are on the line. Um, I, I also invite you to take a look at the short video that is embedded in the press release that went out yesterday afternoon. Um, uh, that also provides a good visual summary of some of the things we're going to touch on and, and the things that are in uh, in our uh, press release yesterday. Um, and uh, it, it also provides a good visual of the stages of the expansions that we're going to talk about this morning. Um, the opening slide um, summarizes some of the key points. And one of them is uh, the Blackwater is clearly now, it always has been in our mind, but it, it is clearly now by anyone's criteria, a tier one asset. Um, the criteria of 500,000 ounces per year of a gold or gold equivalent production is clearly, clearly met. And uh, for the first 10 years, of Blackwater's operation under this study, uh, we're producing in excess of a half million ounces a year. Um, we are sustaining uh, a mine life uh, of 17 years and, and much of that in excess of a half a million ounces a year. Probably the most outstanding uh, impact that I'm sure you'll agree with me uh, is the benefits of economy of scale and some of the specific advantages that if, you've, uh, if we've met with you before that we've talked about, uh, when, when combined, create a very, very low cost per ounce mine. In fact, in the lowest decile of the global cost curve at around seven twelve dollars an ounce. There are not many mines, uh, maybe around 10, uh, that produce more than half a million ounces globally. And this study makes Blackwater one of those rare beasts. Uh, 
most of you are aware, I'm sure, but uh, not only is this a tier one asset, we enjoy a, an exceptional location in central British Columbia, uh, four or five hours drive north of here to Prince George, and, and then uh, a couple of hours down to the mine site. Um, Prince George is the regional capital of British Columbia. Um, and um, uh, it, it enjoys a lot of infrastructure, mainly created due to the history of century or more of forestry activity in this region, number of towns that surround the mine and, and provide not only workforce resources, but also uh, service and, and, and uh, support and supplier support to, to Blackwater. Uh, moderate climate, very supportive government policy. Um, Premier e Eby, who I had the pleasure of introducing at uh, uh, for the second time at our BC Natural Resources Conference here in Prince George last month, made the statement that uh, that uh, when you get your regulatory approvals, you can be assured in British Columbia that you're going to continue to operate and your investment is secure. And that that is sadly a little bit of a rare thing uh, in, in in our sector. Um, the other the other aspect I want to highlight about Blackwater is its is its outstanding credentials in ESG. Um, we have the benefit of renewable, low emission, and low cost, importantly, hydroelectric power, and, and that is one of the key factors that drive our low ca cash cost per ounce. Um, uh, permits are in place, and uh, our First Nations and, and the broader community support um, is, is very present. Uh, we've, we've got a workforce of well in excess of 50% of our workforce are local, and 30% are identified as indigenous. I'm gonna hand, uh, hand uh, over to Jer Jeremy, and uh, he's gonna walk you through the next few slides where um, he can update you on how construction is progressing to date and uh, on phase one I'm talking about, and, and then touch on some of the highlights of the phase two and phase three expansions that are presented in the study. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, David, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I won't go into too much detail with um, the construction update of Blackwater, um, our January release for the end of Q4 um, um, illustrated that. Suffice to say that um, since that, engineering procurement for the project um, is uh, largely complete, actually, and um, all of our critical equipment is currently on site. The process plant construction is progressing very well with the ball mill installation, the uh, shell heads and trunnions effectively complete, and um, the reagents and mill building uh, structural erection is currently underway. In the TSF facility, we've uh, got to the bottom of the Mine Creek cutoff trench, both sides of the Davidson and Mine Creek facility and our focus has been to turn towards the protection from the pressure for the melt period for 2024. Interestingly, we've had a um, very dry winter at uh, Upper Blackwater and um, the team are well, well prepared for uh, the next two to three months in relation to the season changes. My fleet construction has progressed very well. The two 400 tonne, 640 Diggers are effectively constructed and we're going through the last stages of uh, their construction. And I, from memory, we've got five or six, seven, nine, three, 250 tonne trucks that have been uh, completed as well. Operations integration is, has commenced and um, our team's largely been in, uh, in place since the middle of 2021. So uh, we're seeing really good efficiency and stability in that leadership group down there at site. Overarchingly, the project's still on track for a goal pour in H2 2024. And um, back to you, Steve. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I'm going to touch on some of the uh, expansion highlights and then let Jeremy um, talk to some of the, uh, the, the more intimate detail of each phase. Um, the 
the the study highlights the opportunity, and we've we've talked to, to this uh, previously um, in in the in the build up to construction and during construction. But it it now refines and defines the opportunity to accelerate phase two, and not just accelerate phase two as we knew it before. I want I want to highlight the fact that phase two in this study is now presented not as a expansion from six to 12 million tons. In other words, a doubling of uh, processing capacity. It highlights the opportunity to, to increase from six to 15 million tons. That's a material change. And I don't want that to be lost uh, in the details of this, this study. Um, that that drives a whole bunch of things, including production, but also drives higher capital. I'm going to come come to that in a second. You don't get an additional 50% uh, processing capacity than the than the old phase two for nothing. Um, and and uh, Jeremy and I will talk to that in a moment. Um, but the overall impact of accelerating. Phase two is very early on in the mine life. We we chart a path to in excess of a half a million ounces a year uh, of of gold equivalent production, and in fact, averaging over five hundred thousand uh, ton uh, five hundred thousand ounces gold equivalent over the first ten years. Um, based on consensus, gold price um, of eighteen hundred uh, for the long term. Um, that drives a an a NPV at 5% of $3.25 billion. Uh, we think that gold price is conservative. As everyone knows that today's gold price and, uh, is, is in excess of $2,000 an ounce and it has been uh, averaging above 2,000 ounces for the last little while now. Um, and, and, and so we expect to, uh, to see that sort of price, um, at, particularly at uh, converted into Canadian dollars, which is how we operate, given that most of our capital and operating costs are in Canadian dollars, um, we expect to see uh, uh, and enjoy a free free cash flow, uh, potentially significantly more based on today's gold price, um, and that margin um, uh, between our all-in sustaining costs being the seven twelve over the first ten years. Uh, is an industry leading margin um, and generating a very significant uh, free cash flow prediction and forecast of uh, over 500 million uh, free cash flow for over the first 10, year, 10 years per annum uh, and, and producing just under 8 million ounces of our reserve um, uh, at a life of mine cost, including stockpile processing of about 780. Still very low cash cost. Next slide, please. The expansion study, as I touched on earlier, um, assumes that, uh, that, that we, 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 the, the phase one is, is built and commissioned. And as Jeremy mentioned, we're well on that, our way to be doing that uh, with uh, uh, first gold pour forecast for the for second half of this year, literally only several months away. Um, the focus, of course, uh, and the reason for that is that, that the focus is not on phase one any longer uh, from a planning perspective, but the focus is now on when do we bring phase two in and when do we bring phase three in? Given that you know, we are enjoying uh, higher gold prices and the outlook including the conservative consensus numbers of around 1800, uh, will generate significant cash flow uh, and, and, and more than enough to fund an early expansion. As I mentioned, you, some of you would have heard me say this several times in the past, the best way to generate and optimize IRR on invested capital in any business, whether it's gold mining business or the widget business is to use operating cash flow to fund your the expansion of your business and not to dilute your, your shareholders uh, in, the, in that process and not to risk too much capital in the in, in the startup, but, but de-risk the project through staging 
expansions of the business. And that's exactly what we're doing here uh, at Blackwater. Um, so we're bringing phase two forward to year three at a much higher throughput capacity, 50% higher than the original phase two, taking it to 15 million tons per annum. And uh, phase three forward to year seven at higher throughput capacity of 25 million tons, previously 20 million tons uh, under, under previous studies. Um, I want to emphasize that uh, for, for those of you, particularly on the capital market side, who think that we're going to be needing to be rushing out to raise money, it's just not the case. The beauty of our approach to expansion, expansion of our business is that we will pull the trigger on those expansions when we either have made or have a clear path to making the money from our operating business to fund those, those expansions and not before. So that optionality of the precise timing of when we pull the trigger on these phases of expansion is a unique feature in our approach to growing the business here at Blackwater. I think the other aspect to, to touch on is that the, the costs in this study update all previous studies um, on Blackwater uh, to 2024 current costs. That means that, of course, we're reflecting inflationary pressures, the normal inflationary pressures that all of us have been experiencing in our day-to-day -day lives since the 2020, 2021, which are, are significant, by the way, um, you know, seven or eight percent technically in a CPI type measure, but but in some cases, there have been significant increases in in costs. Labor is a good example of that, where those costs are not coming down. There are costs, of course, that uh, we've experienced have fallen uh, since 2020, 2021. And we're experiencing that in in our, in our construction of phase one. Good example for uh, for example is our diesel costs. Our diesel costs are coming in under budget right now. But there are things, uh, and 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 for you analysts who are listening in on the call, I really really need uh, us to do some good work together on this analysis because this industry needs your support for that analysis, um, given the tough times that the, the whole sector is experiencing, um, particularly on the capital costs and operating costs front. Um, you know, there are things like steel, for example, fabricated steel in particular, because fabricated steel has a labor component in it, where you're, we're seeing 20 and 30% increases since 2021 or more in fabricated steel that we think are unlikely to come down. If we're not talking about plate steel where, where, where it's got a very small labor, labor uh, uh, component, we're talking, or raw steel, we're talking about uh, fabricated steel with, with time and, and, and materials in it from, uh, from, from labor, uh, in our view, are not coming down. And that sort of cost and that sort of experience is incorporated in these estimates. Um, uh, another example is concrete. Concrete is has outperformed inflation in terms of cost escalation, uh, and and we're 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 doubtful that concrete uh, will be falling. Partly for also for the same reason, c c uh, concrete is capital uh, is sorry labor intensive because the formwork, the the for, the pouring of the concrete, the manufacture of the concrete, all has a significant labor content in it, and so they're absorbing some of that labor content. Uh, and and we don't think they're coming down. So I think the remarkable thing about this study is that we're, we've absorbed all of those costs. Um, we have increased the the processing capacity in each of the phase two and phase three cap, uh, capital estimates, and so therefore they are not comparable to any previous study. 
that you that that the company has issued. You cannot compare them. Please do not try to our analyst friends. Please do not try to compare them. They're not comparable. They're like comparing apples and passion fruits. Inflation, high, higher costs of certain capital components that are not ever coming down, much higher throughput capacity in each phase now. Um, and, 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 and so we are, are, are unable to compare that capital. Um, I think the final thing, and I'm harping on a little bit about capital because I've heard the scuttlebutt among some of the analysts already, and so you know who you are. Some of you already issued statements on 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 capital uh, increases, and and expressed some surprise in some cases. I'm surprised at your surprise, frankly, um, because uh, the reasons I just talked about, the inability to compare. But I think the point that, that needs to be made in, in good analysis for our industry is this. The only way to compare properly capital costs is a capital cost intensity measure, which is best measured by capital spend divided by processing capacity per ton. And if you do that, for example, in our phase one expenditure, we guided seven, we have guided 730 to 750 Canadian dollars to build phase one. If you use the midpoint of that guidance, on a per ton capacity of throughput of six million tons, our capital cost per ton, our capital intensity measure is $123. Canadian per ton. That compares with some of the other development companies globally, but particularly in North America, like our friends uh, at the Magino project, like our friends at the Cote project, like our friends at the Premier depo uh, Deposit, like our friends at Valentine, and like our friends at Greenstone and like our friends at Tocatinzino. There are four or five or six, I don't know how many there, there, there were, but five, five or six other projects that have been built over the last few years, sort of around the time or earlier than Blackwater, where the cost per ton of their processing capacity is in some cases two to three times what our cost per ton of $123 a ton of capex intensity is at phase one Blackwater, two to three times. Then if you move your mind to what the capital intensity measure is for phase two, at the estimated capex for phase two, for 15 million tons of throughput capacity, that that comes to $66 Canadian a ton. I don't see anyone else in the industry building mines and that sort of large scale capacity for anything like that number. The Blackwater team is doing an exceptional job on phase one and it will do a similar job on phase two and phase three. And then just to finish the same analysis, phase three, we estimate CapEx at $852 million Canadian for a 25 million ton expanded plan. That's an additional 10 million tons from phase two to phase three. If you do the simple math, 852 million tons divided by an additional 10 million tons of throughput capacity is $85 a ton of, through, of, of processing capacity. Now that's slightly higher than phase two for one reason. If you follow the phase, phase three expansion scenario, that is a whole new plant. That is a new primary crusher and a whole new separate circuit all the way through to the gold room uh, in phase three. So not surprising that it's a bit higher, but still 
well and truly below the 123 that it's costing us for phase one. So please, analysts, when you do your analysis, happy to talk to you about that. But let's 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 consider those 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 metrics um, and and recognize those things for the good of of our industry and 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 getting some good messages out to some of the investor accounts that that support this industry. Um, I think I've covered um, most of those uh, uh, points um, in this slide um, already. Um, this is an analysis of the first five and first 10 years uh, and life of mine of our, of our uh, financial model um, and the average production and throughputs for the first five and 10 years of this mine. Next slide. Oh, uh, yeah, the thing I will mention, sorry. Thank you, Meg. The thing I will mention is all of these numbers are after repaying the $382 million of uh, uh, project debt on phase one and after the gold and silver participation that, that sit on Blackwater. So these are net of, of, of those outflows. Uh, this slide um, illustrates something similar, but uh, you know, essentially, you know, you, as you can see, in some cases, we're producing well in excess of a half million ounces in the early years of this mine, and even in years 12 and 13 projected, we're, we're uh, touching on 600,000 ounces a year before we reach the stockpile phase. Personally, um, and I'll, I'll touch on this in the my, rep, my comments in wrapping up, the stockpile phase, uh, I think, will be pushed out uh, because I think that will be supplanted by new ore from the pit as a result of reoptimizations at current gold prices and as a result of uh, extensions of uh, extensions of, uh, of the mine life uh, because of uh, open open uh, uh, strikes in the northwest and in the south of the ore body. Uh, Good flexibility and, and exposure to, to gold prices, uh, fairly modest downside um, uh, from our base case in terms of impact on NPV after tax and some, some fairly robust economics of spot gold today. Uh, this uh, slide also says some similar things about sensitivity, this time uh, translating it to Canadian dollars. Um, I, I've always thought that Canada is a great place. Australia has this attribute as well, by the way, where, where you have this automatic pressure relief valve that when you, you see a, a, a lower gold price, almost always the Canadian uh, exchange rate in US dollars falls. And, and so you get a, a fairly flat output on a, on a Canadian dollar gold equivalent. Um, and that provides a nice buffer to our margins here in Canada. And as I said, also in places like Australia. Uh, I'm going to hand the microphone back to Jeremy uh, to talk a little bit more about how we build phase two. Thanks, David. Um, if I can just start off with, um, you know, the phase one, phase two, and phase three philosophy from a design intent point of view at Blackwater is simple, maintainable, offerable, repeatable, and reliable. And I think the phase two and phase three expansion cases clearly demonstrate the um, that intent and also support the disciplined approach to execution and operations, which we've been um, presenting to a lot of people for a long time now. Phase two, as you can see on your screen there, involves coming left, if you like, or to forward to year three operations in the, uh, in the study. That involves a um, basically a non-intrusive expansion of the facility to 15 million tonne, which for those of you who know me, can be done largely on the run without impacting the revenue stream of phase one operations. It's very important. So um, it, um, it also will have, when you look at it laid out um, in plan view, um, very distinct work areas between the operational phase and the construction phase, which um, don't intrude on each other, importantly. Phase three demonstrates this as well. Um, the uh, uh, the layout and the compactness of the layout provides even further opportunity, as you'll see in the third phase three case, 
um, to look at some ups upside options further and more, which we'll cover off towards the back of this presentation. Next slide, please. Phase three, um, if you look at the render on the screen, which brings left <laughs> the phase three operations to year seven or forward, if you like. Um, impressively, the, um, the phase three operation will uh, deliver on average 516,000 gold equivalent ounces a year. I must mention phase two was 544,000 from memory, uh, or 561 actually, it um, had a free cash flow of about 544 million a year. Uh, by industry standards, pretty respectable. The phase three expansion to 25 million tonnes, of course, same again with two, largely unintrusive, can be done on the run, if you like, with phase two operations running um, alone, if you like, and not reliant on any of the other dependent parts. This long term provides a lot of flexibility and operational redundancy to Blackwater um, and has really good synergies in relation to things such as spares, maintenance planning and activity shutdown planning, uh, whereas there will always be a stream of the one or two streams of the flow sheet operating at any point in time, even during a mill reline on one particular area in the plant. The, um, what, um, what's interesting when you look at these last two renders is this is just a, a picture of the flow sheet, but the asset is representative of the same design intent across the mining services area, the operations camp, which are all expandable, repeatable, reliable, maintainable, and actually simple. Um, so we're looking forward to, um, to showing you all down the site. We can go across to the, the mining part of the study, please, Meg. Nothing much to add here other than uh, the mining activity is quite straightforward, fairly simple. Um, in the study, we present a 15-year uh, mining operation with, uh, two, with, with following years supported by processing the stockpiles through the 25 million tonne plant. Um, nothing's really changed in terms of the early, early mine years target, higher grade, low strip material. Um, and um, as the phase three plant comes online, we start diving down and um, expanding to the north as we progressively um, get deeper in the pit. Certainly near mine and regional exploration activities are something that Stephen will no doubt touch on as we move through here. Mining operations is pretty misere at uh, 365 days a year. And yes, we work Christmas day as well with uh, two 12 hour shifts and um, with a conventional drill and blast fleet with two 400 ton 6040 echo configuration shovels, which benefit for selectivity for our team down on site and a 600 ton face shovel for the waste and um, non-oil material movement. Supported by, of course, the 793 240-ton uh, haul truck and ancillary fleet. Move across to uh, allergic piece, man. Pretty straight up flow sheet um, with impressive recoveries. I think anyone who um, can have a flow sheet that presents at above 93% is, um, is in a pretty good state. And um, Blackwater clearly exhibits this. Um, the plant one plant, obviously, as we know, is a three-stage crush supported by a dual drive ball mill with uh, twin VSD motor operation, variable speed drives, um, that feed a gravity circuit and a carbon and leach processing train. Stage two and stage three do the same with the exception of stage two and three having a sag and ball mill um, and pebble crushing circuits uh, included. This provides greater flexibility to the operation as we get more mature in the mine life to, um, to optimise things such as grind size, crush product size, particle size di distribution, um, and optimise the process trains as we move through the, uh, the maturing mine life. Typical triple double ARL elution circuit, and we have a sulphur burny, uh, burner system, which is detoxing the, uh, the tailing, tailing slurry, um, supported by combustion of sulphur prill. I think I'll just hand over to Stephen now to um, 
it's an amateur, but uh, many of the opportunities we have, we yeah. can't get on this slide, that's for sure. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks, Jeremy. Before I dive into some of these things, I, I, I just want to also highlight something um, based on some feedback we received from from uh, from the market. Uh, some concerns about uh, you know whether we're able to pay a dividend, whether we're when we're going to be able to fund the, the, the capital on phase twos and phase threes, et cetera, and uh, debt service. Just very high level, and, and bear in mind, we are yet to make an investment decision. As we flagged, uh, we're going to give ourselves until the second half of this year to do that, um, and, and maybe maybe later than that, but uh, we're, we're flagging H2 this year. Um, the, this study suggests, based on the inputs and assumptions, that we will generate in the first five years circa $2.5 billion. Any of you are worried about how we are going to pay uh, our project debt back? How are we going to fund the CapEx and maybe have some room for dividends? Need to have a look at those numbers. $2.5 billion, if this study is correct based on its assumptions. Our debt service is three hundred and eighty-five million dollars, and phase two expenditure is five eighty-two. That's less than a billion dollars over the over five years. That leaves us, based on the study, something like one and a half billion dollars for other things. Um, so we think it demonstrates a degree of comfort that this plan, this this strategy of expansion, is well achievable. And in fact, it allows us to look at some of the additional opportunities, which segues quite nicely into this slide. The first of which is one of the interesting thing, and, and Jeremy's probably better to talk to this one than, than, than I, uh, but, but um, we've got some really interesting features. And, and th th this is not alone uh, in, in the scale of big mines around the world. Um, big deposits uh, and big mines um, generate an advantage of um, having stable centroids of operation. For example, one pit, one waste dump, one TSF, which means that all of the, the advantages of other, uh, of, of, of static infrastructure can be taken into a future alternate methods for transportation of, for example, waste material. And one of the studies that will come out of this study is to see what our options are for alternate methods of transporting. It could be uh, cable, cable haulage, for example, and that would take advantage of the very low uh, five or six cents a kilo, kilowatt hour power that we enjoy at site. That could have a material difference to our cost of hauling waste uh, down to the waste pile in the TSF. We've already talked about this, but the electrification of the hauling fleet for ore and waste for that matter also stands to benefit significantly our, our operating cost per tonne and increase our, uh, our green credentials by reducing our, our, uh, our emissions per tonne of, of uh, operations. Uh, and we're working closely with Caterpillar te Technology to to uh, to look at whether that's a possibility in years 27, 28, and beyond. Uh, automation of hauling operations, um, uh, creating new jobs, but different types of jobs uh, from by 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 operating these these haulage this haulage fleet from from a room um, uh, remotely uh, is is very exciting for for everyone involved in the project, uh, particularly those uh, locally. Um, 
uh, we've got some potential process engineering initiatives. Uh, there, there's sulfides in the in 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 these ores, which lend itself potentially to a float a float circuit, which could reduce costs and improve and, and reduce capital um, in in phase three, for example. That needs more work to study. And then finally, and, and um, this is this is an important one. Uh, which we have deliberately under emphasized to date because you know we're getting on with building phase one but this this deposit has been uh, optimized and and we've made made no changes to the resource and reserve base upon which the, the expansion study is based um, to update it for current gold prices this 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 uh, study is based on a 1400 US dollar per ounce gold price. And we see real potential to revisit that optimization of this resource in the future based on current prices, as well as revised costs and economies of scale. And that's another area of study which we will embark on over the next year or two that will drive a significant, in my view, increase in mine life. In addition to the fact that the deposit, like many large scale single deposits of Blackwater's uh, characteristics, uh, is open to the North, the Northwest and the South. And I'll show you some slides on that uh, right now. This is a slide that uh, many of you have seen before, but uh, the, the pit shell, resource pit shell, when run at $2,000 an ounce uh, uh, versus the $1,400, which is the purple outline, the 2,000 uh, ounce uh, shell is the red outline. Just by way of summary, that, that adds, if run, another 3.2 million ounces of gold equivalent production, if that was deemed to be economic in the future. So there in itself, without a single drill hole being drilled, shows the potential to add significant years to this mine life on top of the existing study. And if we move to the next slide, it'll, it'll hopefully demonstrate what I was talking about before. As you can see, the gold blocks are the, the, is the resource block model. And as you can see, it, it pokes through the northern pit walled and down plunge to the north and northwest, as well as a more vertical structure to in, in the south. It, it plunges and pokes through the, the current uh, pit design wall, uh, telling us that we need to do a lot more drilling. And that will be on the agenda over the next uh, 12 months or, or, or so as we get into phase one operations and, and, and we start to uh, generate cash flow from which we can we can start doing this drill. Um, so lots of opportunity to re-extend my life uh, even at these higher throughputs uh, that 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 the study considers. That brings us to the end of our formal deck. I think we went for a little bit longer than than uh, we we planned, but I I hope it was valuable information. And uh, operator, we're happy to. Uh, uh, open up uh, to to questions, voice, and uh, text. Certainly. We'll now begin the question and answer session. If you wish to ask a question, please click on the Q&A icon on the left-hand side of your screen. You'll see two options to raise your hand to join the question queue and ask your questions verbally, or write a question to submit your question in writing. Webinar participants who are introduced to ask their questions verbally will see a prompt appear on screen. Please click Continue to confirm that you're ready to have your line opened. Analysts who have dialed in to the conference call may press star then 1 on their telephone keypad to join the question queue. Our first question is from Wayne Lamb. Wayne, your line is open. Yeah, thanks guys, and thanks for hosting the call. Um, maybe for Stephen, uh, I guess on the CapEx intensity, um, I, I mean, you're, you're right. The uh, intensity metrics uh, for phase one are quite low versus some of the comparable Canadian projects. Um, I guess from a risk standpoint, like if you think about it the other way, um, perhaps some might say that 
you know, that CapEx number that you guys have guided uh, has room to increase just given the other project build that have been completed. So just curious um, how you guys have been able to kind of uh, mitigate some of those cost pressures seen and, and how you're able to complete uh, the Blackwater build on phase one at such a lower uh, intensity spend. Um, thanks, Wayne. Um, and that's a great question. Um, look, uh, th there's no single answer to that question. Wayne and I'll, I'll invite uh, Jeremy to comment, but but my 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 uh, my brief response would be it's it's a it's a number of things. Probably the the, the most important one um, is is the importance of uh, construction duration. If you look at some of the other developers in in our sector. Almost without exception, every construction period duration is well in excess of ours. And 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 what it recognizes is is that construction has a fixed cost component that is incurred regardless of uh, of of whether you're you're, you're under intense act, a construction activity or otherwise. Every month you incur, every week you incur X dollars a month or, or day. And so if you can build it quickly and on time and not be stopped for any reason, uh, and some of you have heard this story before, but if any of you built, built or renovated homes and a builder says he's going to do it in three months and then he finds white ants and then he has to stop work and, and, and re-engineer your floor and, and, and then your your uh, you, instead of uh, three months, your renovation is going to take twelve months. Uh, the original price of two fifty thousand dollars to renovate your bathrooms and kitchen all of a sudden go to a million dollars very quickly. So it's the same sort of sort of thing. That would I would say that is is the single biggest factor. And of course, there's the Jeremy factor that, that he would never say, but Jeremy and his team have built probably more of these in the last 10 of, of, of scale gold projects than, than almost any other uh, company in our, in our space. And, and, and I think that that, that, that uh, uh, experience bears well. The, um, it, you know, the, our ability to react and, and, and uh, on, on schedule changes, on, on quantity changes, on price changes, whatever comes at us, is a skill that is a construction skill that few have. Jeremy, you want to add to that, or have I covered it? No, oh, no, thanks for the kind words there. Um, I think the uh, the maturity of the the quantities and the engineering design too, as you, when you move into the execution phase, is critical. And um, I think project demonstrates that. Conversely, a lot of companies and a lot of projects I see have a ramp up when they, um, you know, when they initiate project execution. Whereas our team was in place well before that and for the visitors and Wayne's been to site as well. That management team was in place well before the execution phase commenced. So the ramp up period to get into construction is shortened significantly by being uh, prepared uh, in that event. So uh, I, I think there's a number of things and certainly only having one winter um, and a very tepid part of uh, British Columbia or in Canada um, is certainly uh, something that the plan is um, demonstrating the benefit of. But that's your question, Wayne. Yeah, that's perfect. Thanks. And then maybe just um, looking at the uh, capital for the expansions, and and even on the capital intensity, um, it you know it seems to have increased by uh, quite a bit. And you know, aside from just the uh, larger capacity sizing on the expansions, uh, just wondering. You know where you guys are seeing uh, kind of the uh, cost pressures on that, and then maybe just curious what the rationale was um, behind pushing the expanded design even further to 25 million tons per day versus the uh, prior uh, feasibility study. Um, I, I'm not sure you, of your comment that that, that 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 there's. I think you said even on a cost per ton of intensity that that that, that there. There's escalation, and that's just not factually correct. Um, there's actually a reduction. 
uh, from phase one to phase two, from $123 per ton of capacity to uh, $66, like half um, uh, per ton of capacity in phase, for phase two additional capacity. And then in phase three, as I mentioned, it, it, it's 80, 85 per ton of, of capacity being 10 million at 850, 850 million because we're building a whole separate plan, including primary crusher and, and, and everything where phase two expansion takes advantage of the existing crushing infrastructure. Um, so I, 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 I think the analysis will show a reduction, not an increase in intensity, which is the right measure. Um, where are we, we think uh, cost pressure, as I mentioned earlier, you know, anything that, that labor touches, fabricated steel, concrete, et cetera, you, we, we're definitely seeing a permanent cost change and, and cost change above the CPI. And all of those have been factored into uh, our capital estimates in phases two and three. Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm calculating on the incremental uh, expanded capacity from phase one to phase two, and then two to three relative to the capital, but uh, I can review the numbers uh, outside of that. Um, and then maybe just curious, uh, you know, going back to the uh, phase one construction progress, you know, good, good to see um, some of the progress being made at site and on the transmission line clearing. Just wondering if there's been any elements that have kind of lapsed in terms of timeline, uh, for example, on the enclosure of the plant, and then just curious um, when the construction of the power line uh, might be completed. Uh, short answer is, uh, as Jeremy said, we're, 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 we continue to be on schedule to H2 Goldport. Um, uh, things like enclosure of the, of the, uh, the mill buildings and reagent buildings is on schedule. Um, we couldn't enclose them until things like the ball mill was assembled. Uh, and and that is now largely complete, and we we are beginning to clad those buildings as we speak. And um, uh, transmission line is uh, is midsummer for for commissioning. Okay, perfect. Good to see uh, things on on track, and uh, best of luck with um, the remaining build. Thank you. Next question. The next, yes, the next question is from Chris Thompson. Chris Thompson, your line is open. Right. Uh, good morning, gents, and, and Meg. Thanks for hosting this call. Two quick questions for you. Um, the first question, I guess, if you if you decide to go ahead with the the early phase two expansion, um, what sort of time frame uh, is needed to to start phase two in order to deliver the uh, the 15 million ton per annum? anticipated in year three. Is this just a roll on from phase one? Uh, to, to a certain extent, yes. And, certain, and, and to a certain extent, some of the site presence, there, there will be some just simple roll on. There's some lead items, as you can imagine, things like ball mill sag mills will require ordering, but they're, they're uh, perhaps in the second half of this year. Um, but the, to the extent that any outflow will be required for that, they would be very modest deposit types of you know, sub $10 million dollars, if if that, uh, to 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 get to get in the queues of some of these uh, long long lead item um, uh, equipment for phase two. Anything to add, Jeremy? Great, right, thanks. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Stephen. And you know, Steve, I, I, I do, I do hear you. By the way, as far as capex and intensity and that, but just want to delve a little bit into the sustaining capital. I guess for the first five years of uh, of my life, uh, I think you quote four hundred and ninety nine million there, which again is is materially higher than the feasibility. But as we know, is this just a factor of the higher run rates moving from the six uh, past the twelve million ton a year to the fifteen million ton a year? In terms of uh, of of uh, nominal numbers rather than per unit, um, yeah, yes, yeah, so I think I think the analysis has to be based on ounces and or 
and or uh, tons uh, processed to 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 be comparable. Yeah. Okay, gents. All right. Thanks a lot, and uh, congratulations. Good call. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Andrew Mikachuk from, uh, sorry, just Andrew, your line is open. Hey, can you hear me? Hi, Andrew. Yeah. Hi, Stephen. Um, maybe, maybe a question for Jeremy, I think, in, in terms of, you know, having ultimate flexibility to push the go button on, uh, on phase two, um, how much kind of, uh, basic or detailed engineering would you like to do and um, how much would that cost and how long would it take so that, uh, you know, you have ultimate, as I mentioned, flexibility to go to the board with a, a very detailed plan? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, I, um, obviously, uh, as an engineer, I'd like to do as much as I can, but um, um, within reason, we, um, we would look at, um, you know, some catalysts around the phase one construction triggering um certain sequence of events where I, I would present to to Stephen um uh, recommendation of where we need to go next um largely the process facility if you like um with um the study and obviously with stage one intact a lot of the quantities um and a lot of the design is is largely not done but very well advanced uh, above, beyond a standalone fs if you like um so the milling circuit um, and uh, the combination circuit is pretty much known. So um, I, uh, I don't see too much of that early engineering uh, work being needed to be done. Um, but certainly we, we want to maintain discipline in completing stage one and uh, making sure that we get the stage one asset uh, running well. And um, in parallel with that, with these activities, then uh, I'll be in a position to um, speak to Stephen and the board. Okay. Um, and, and I think this question, the next one, Jeremy, is also for you. It's been partially answered earlier, but in terms of visible things that we should watch for in your updates and your photo updates at construction between now and, and first gold pour was already mentioned in closing the buildings. Um, is there anything else that we should keep an eye out for in, in terms of, you know, seeing the, the wiring piping crews up there or, uh, you know, completion of liners or dams or something, what, what, or maybe more accurately, what are you up. watching for between now and then? Andrew, you're going to have to come up and visit because you won't be able to see inside the buildings because a lot of the, a lot of the activity will move inside buildings uh, and the external the, the, the construction, like the crushing circuit, for example, um, will, will get closer to completion over the next month or two. Yeah, I also say that, um, you know, the transmission line right away is effectively for the large part, you know, should be complete within the next short term. So uh, there's not two major optical, um, you know, changes that you'll see when you're looking at photo now. It gets a little bit more, I wouldn't say boring, but certainly with the sheds going up in the process facility, um, the all being on surface largely on, in the open pit. Um, and uh, the TSF, Cut-off trench um, pretty much in final condition now before we start, and we have progressively started filling the zone S material um, for the wall. Um, the, la the footprint overall um, is largely intact, and uh, there's not too much more to do. Yeah. Well, okay. It's great to, to hear the level of confidence there, and um, yeah, look forward to uh, uh, an invite for any site visits that you guys are, are running there. Um, just one simple last question, if if you guys have the patience for me, um, and I might have missed it, but uh, when the slide went up with the, I think that was a $2,000 optimized pit, um, just for scale, give us a, if you could give us a sense of the strip ratio. I think the strip ratio averaged out to just fractionally over two on the current pit. Um, how does that look on that? Kind of two thousand dollar pit at this point in time, without additional you know, I, I, infill Andrew, drilling. I can't, Andrew, I can't give you. A, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I think it's incremental, and bear in mind that most of those answers are on the the low wall, the north northwest wall downhill. So it won't it, 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 to the extent that that it, that 
that a pushback is required, it won't be a significant addition, I don't imagine, to the to the life of my street breacher. But I don't I don't know the precise answer. Um, and and just on your comment around uh, progress, look, it's the mining business. Um, we're, we're grateful for the for the, the the effort by the team so far, but you know it is the mining industry. Things things can happen, and it's just a question of how good our team is in responding to whatever they, those things might be, and 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 continue to deliver on the things we promised. Yeah. Well. Um... Thank you very much for uh, for the the detail and those answers, and uh, well done to uh, uh, Jeremy and your team, and then all the engineers who put this together. I'll I'll sign off and let other people ask questions. Thank you. We're we're uh, running short of time, uh, but we'll take what operator will take one more question, please. Certainly. The next question is from Don Demarco. Don Demarco, your line is open. Oh, thank you. Just got a couple quick ones. Uh, Jeremy, will Sedgman be involved in phase two and three development? Um, we haven't made any decisions on, uh, you know, the, the development of stage two, as, as Stephen mentioned earlier. And, um, but certainly they're performing well in the process facility. And, um, you know, we'll consider um, um, using the people we know for sure. Okay. And, and so you're and, not four and, months and, away and from... And and it's it's too, and it's, and it's too early, Don, to, to make that decision. You, you, you know us well enough. Um, we uh, we make people work for the for the for the uh, relationships that we have and and uh, you know we've got to finish this one first. Okay, um, thank you for that. And if time permits, uh, if I may ask another quick question or two, is that okay? Go ahead. And 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 we'll, we'll there's one other question I see from Jeremy Hoy, so we'll we'll deal with that one too. And then I think we're out of time. But keep keep, okay. keep going, Don. So, uh, so you're now four months away from H2. Um, so when do you expect to get more granular on the timing of the first pour? Uh, in the summer. Okay. So we wouldn't expect it to be in the for beginning of H2 then, but uh, we'll, we'll look for updates then. Um, now, you mentioned, Stephen, that a unique as aspect of this project is that you can pull the trigger on phase two when you have a clear path to making money. But how do you balance this perceived flexibility against the potential savings from not demobilizing the team? Well, that'll be simply a part of the analysis on in, that we'll do in the second half of this year uh, around the investment decision. Okay. Uh, and then just final quick one. Um, can you just comment on the labor availability and labor inflation? How many positions do you need to fill as you transfer beyond first pour and H2? Um, good question. Uh, we, the, the, the workforce is uh, for f operating uh, phase of the mine is uh, for phase one is around 300. Um, we are in the process of retraining some of the construction, particularly the the uh, the, the earth moving uh, workforce uh, to to, to uh, migrate across to operating. Um, phase and and the equipment fleet that is employed there. Um, I think we've said this in the past, uh, Don, but one, one of the sad things about what's happening in the communities around us, and there's, there's several, seven or eight towns uh, to the north, the northwest, the uh, east, and the southeast of us, which are all, almost all have their heritage and history in the in the in the forestry business and the forestry business. I, I think we've seen in the last uh, at least uh, uh, five or six years up to twenty mill pulp mills and sawmills closed because of the certain dynamics and downturn in in that sector. Um, and uh, and even as recently last month, there was a, there's a sawmill closed in Vanhu, which is the closest town to the mine to the north of us, uh, where uh, several hundred people are or will be laid off. And, you know, the great thing that we can offer it to the community is jobs and training. And, you know, an, an, an electrician who, who works in the maintenance group of a sawmill or pulp mill doesn't require that much retraining to be an electrician in a CIL process plant. And you know that's exactly what we're doing, and that's exactly what Jeremy touched on earlier. Um, 
uh, because we are in a very fortunate and privileged position in this community to to be able to take up some of the the the, the, the surplus skill base that is is, is is existing in the community as a result of the downturn in the forestry sector. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Well, good luck with the completion of phase one, and we'll look for updates as you progress. Thank you, Don. The next question is from Jeremy Hoy. Please go ahead. Hi, <clears throat> Stephen Dean, um, May, and Jeremy and uh, Jerry. Appreciate you guys taking my call. Uh, my my question here last minute. Uh, it's been some been some good discussion, so I'll, I'll be quick with my questions. Um, Jeremy, you touched on this when you answered Andrew's question about things to watch for. You mentioned several of um, the earthworks and geotech components of the project. Do you have an estimate of how much of the earthworks are completed in terms of percentage-wise for the phase um, one? I, I can't give you an exact number. Um, you know, our next update will be obviously in the Q1. Um, but I can say that the, you know, on a on a, on a ratio of 100% of the total earth we need to move to uh, to pour gold, um, we're on track and on schedule. All of the mining infrastructure access ways, um, and even the haul roads have been cutting. And um, the TSF main wall trench, the version system, and all the uh, the northern, southern, and central water transfer and collection areas are complete. Interestingly, we completed the late 15-16 earthworks, which is the reversal of the Davidson River, um, some six months ahead of schedule, which was last year. So um, certainly, um, what you'll what I what I what I think you'll expect to see, and you can see towards the second quarter and as we move through this year, is a pretty compact work front at the particularly the TSF area, where really it's just the bulk fill activity um, as the as the main wall is coming out of the ground. Everything else pretty much is in place. And um, yes, we've got some operations camps and expansions to do with the camp areas. But um, the key critical areas are well advanced um, and they've met all of our expectations to date. Okay, that's that's helpful. Thank you. And and I guess as has been mentioned, uh, the benefit of the pit being so close to the surface, the bedrock um, is is quite beneficial for the project as well. Uh, one last one. Obviously, you, you touched on this with the upside potential and uh, the low cutoff grade you've used for the reserves. Um, if I remember correctly, I think there's another four million ounces of gold sitting in resources, um, and you know, obviously, a lot of factors going into the analysis of potential pit expansions. Um, are you guys going to plan to provide a reserve and resource update regularly each year, where those assumptions will be revisited? Once we get into operations, Jeremy, yes, that would be the normal convention, as you know, for our industry. Yep, certainly. Okay, great. That's it for me. Thanks. And uh, congrats. Half a million ounces is, uh, is a great place to be. Thanks, Jeremy. Unfortunately, everyone, uh, we're out. Of, in fact, we're over time. Um, but I do appreciate everyone's kind commitment and contributions and questions. Uh, for those of you who have unanswered questions, uh, may will help uh, facilitate responses to those uh, over the next 24, 48 hours. Um, send her an, an email or, uh, or uh, the, uh, the info at artemisgoldinc.com um, e uh, email address, and uh, we'll do our best to address any outstanding questions. But once again, thank you for your time and participation, and uh, we look forward to seeing all of you in person sometime soon. This brings to a conclusion today's webinar. You may disconnect your lines. Thank you for participating and have a pleasant day.